is your live episode 535 9 Clapper D28 27, recorded on the 10th of 979, replay 2BA, guest David Gordon. Hello there, welcome to This Is Your Life and a story that affects each and every one of us. It begins with these opium poppies in Thailand's Golden Triangle, their major market Australia and growing numbers of addicts. Children of addicts and thousands of others of all ages enjoy drug-free normal lives today thanks to our guest of honour. Our story tonight is about this first Australian to actually succeed in reversing the tide of self-destruction. Right now, our guest of honour is at the Sydney headquarters of the Drug Rehabilitation Centre, Who's, which means we help ourselves. David, hello. Roger Clemson. We haven't met, I don't believe. How do you do? David, at this moment, on that camera, it's my pleasure to say to you, David Gordon, this is your life. David, we've asked Margaret, your wife, to join us tonight as we tell your story because you and she are co-workers in the same cause. David, in 1970, the drug addict has nowhere to go for help except hostels for the homeless and down and outs until if they were lucky enough, they were told to find a man called David. Once an addict yourself, you never falter or stop in your drive to help others. It's called We Help Ourselves. It's an approach to life. Two young men who, with your help, have made it out of the drug scene, Patrick Polnov and John Roach. <laughs> Patrick, first of all, how did David help you to help yourself? Well, I've been using drugs since I was 14 years old. <clears throat> uh, by the time I was 22, I was pretty desperate to do something about myself. And um, in Mr. Gordon, I saw ideals um, I could, I wanted to live up to. Um, since then, I've, I've come to know myself better. I've got a, a direction in life um, for what I've got now. Thanks, Patrick. John, will you tell us your story? Well, Mr. Gordon's always telling me that I can do things that I can't, that I think I can't do. And uh, a couple of years ago, I went to him for help, and he said, "No way." And I stormed out of there, planning to kill him, blow him up. And uh, I come back a couple of years later, and he told me of the things that I could do. And uh, today I can do them. And uh, both Patrick and myself are going to work with Mr. Gordon for the next 12 months at least. Uh, to help the people who are lucky enough to be around and for those that aren't now. Thanks. John, thank you very much. David, the secret of your success with addiction is that you've been through it yourself. Indeed, the pattern of your story is almost identical to Patrick's and John's. But let's now go back in time to your birth in Govan near Glasgow on April the 23rd, 1937. Your parents, George and Jean Gordon, name you David. You grow up in Rathlin Street in the shadow of the giant John Brown shipyards. I thought he had gone forever. David, the person you've been wanting to meet most in the world for 16 years, from Derbyshire, your mother, and with her, your sister, Helen Wright.
past 16 years, David has been winning the battles against addiction for himself and for others. But more than anything, he has wanted to see you. What would you like to say to your son? I'm very proud and happy about them. Thank you, Jean. It's certainly been a long time since the family's been together. You have a great deal to talk about tonight, I know, and thank you all very much for coming all this way to be with David tonight. Thank you, thank you Jean, and thank you, Helen. So at 15, you leave school to join the Merchant Marine. You've always made friends easily. It's an exciting time and you begin to drink with your shipmates. On one trip, you make port in Sydney and from then on are so enthusiastic, they name you Aussie Jock. Two years later, bound for Auckland on board the Sydney Star, you fall into the hold. Broken arms, broken jaw, broken hands and internal injuries. The doctors administer large doses of morphine. At the age of 20, you are hooked on a deadly combination, morphine and alcohol. David, you broke both of those habits. Will you tell us how? Well, <clears throat> I cold turkeyed off the morphine and uh, substituted alcohol. And then I ended up in the old Matthew Talbot Hostel in Sydney, uh, at the age of 27. And there I was to meet a, a man by the name of Bill, who was to have a great attraction for me. And through him, I was introduced uh, to the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I learned there that the three most important things in my life was self-awareness, self-acceptance, and to believe in a higher power. By 1969, David, you're in Australia, working as a crane driver. You have a family of three lovely children who are growing up right now and of whom you're very proud. And then comes the recession. In Sydney, at the age of 35, without a job, walking down the street in Crow's Nest, you see this sign. You feel it's preordained. You go in and take their training course as a counsellor. You become a crusader in your belief that you can help combat the degrading social evil of drug addiction. So we decided to start our own organisation. Pharmacist Mike Menson. Mike, David had ideas that were different from the established drug referral and counselling services. Will you tell us about those ideas? Well, David believed that a man must help himself. And that the person that could really help a drug addict was an ex-addict. So we decided to call our particular organisation, We Help Ourselves. And the idea behind this was to create an emergency drug service because the time of crisis in a drug addict's life is when they OD or when they're picked up by the police. And then to have a house, which we could call whose house, where the drug addicts could meet together, discuss their mutual problems and get on the way to recovery. And further to this, to take away the stigma that was attached to drug addiction. Well, Mike, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. It's a 24 hour a day job and it costs you your marriage. Unexpected things happen. Some addicts rebel. One helps himself to your money, another to your one and only good suit. But you stick with it and go on talking to everybody that you can. And here is somebody who listened, David, top advertising executive, Jim Kiernan. <laughs> Jim, you were the first president of Who's. Will you tell us about it and how you became involved? Yes, Roger. Um, I was with the community service organisation called Kiwanis. We had a chapter in Crow's Nest. And Dave came along to talk to us one day to explain the problems of drug addiction. And we were tremendously impressed by his honesty and dedication. And we were privileged to give him his first cheque. And in those days, in McMahon's Point, the cheque, which I think was only a paltry $130, made all the difference uh, for that particular week because it meant uh, Dave could eat. <laughs> I think the thing about Dave is that uh, he recognised the problem uh, before 
it reached the proportion it is today. And I think he's done more to help uh, the cause of drug rehabilitation than anyone else in this state, at least. Well, thank you, Jim. We'll be back in just a moment to see how David's dedication to the human cause actually succeeds. David, your approach to drug addiction is in conflict with current theories. You oppose the use of methadone firmly, believing it's wrong to substitute one addiction for another. You're helped by an eminent psychiatrist, Dr. David Emmett Smith, now on film from New Guinea. I'm sorry that I can't be with you tonight, but I'm able to look back over many days and many nights working together, working with addicts and learning a lot about addiction and about addicts. I learnt a lot from you, David. I think, though, above all, I learnt the meaning of persistence. You persisted with your work when most people would have given up. And tonight, we're seeing some of the results of that persistence. My congratulations to you, David, on what you have achieved. David, Langton Clinic, a treatment centre for alcoholics, invites you to put your method into practice and you move your charges to Langton House. You give up crane driving and now concentrate wholly on your life's work, addiction. The rewards are often a surprise. Remember the night I cracked a bottle of wine over you then? <laughs> now director of Who's Armadale, Dale Hunter, and with him director of Who's Parent Counselling Services, Fred Reese. <laughs> Dale, uh, you met David while he was trying to make Langton House work. Was that hit on his head your uh, sort of last hurrah? <laughs> no, not really, Roger. I, I hit him on the head and he got up and kicked my ribs in. <laughs> <laughs> and David's not one to pass judgment on people, you know, and he took me back. And, um, you know, David saved my life. And uh, he's just a beautiful human being. He really is. Well, he gave me back my life. Uh, when I first met David, I was in the psychiatric centre and uh, he sent me down to his house in, uh, in uh, Langton, old Langton house in Marrickville. And uh, I uh, was told by the psychiatrist in front of David that I should have been, I was a chronic addict and I should be locked away in an old men's home. And David said, no, not in your life. And uh, we're gonna give him a go. And uh, he did. But subsequently I busted, not long after, about three weeks after, and I had to camp in the middle of the night, sort of Sunday morning, very early. Four ODs later, I found out that he was right and uh, he came to visit me in Balmain Hospital. And what he'd told me was true and uh, the last bloke that I wanted to see come in that batwing doors of the intensive care unit was David. <laughs> and uh, when he was walking down towards the bed, I thought to myself, well, here he is, I'd better say uh, something to him and then he'll say something else to me and then I'll say something else to him. And when he replies, I'll tell him to get nicked. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't. He come down to the bed and he, he stood at the end of the bed and he said, go mate, you're going to come back and join us. And I said, get nicked, David. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, because he didn't fall into the trap that, as an addict, I wanted him to. And uh, we knew from that experience that he had to stay two jumps ahead of all the addicts in the future. And uh, we learned from that. And that's, you know, I, I reckon he's, you know, I just love the fellow. I just do. As part of whose ongoing work, we thank you, Fred and Dale, for being here and telling us about it tonight. Thanks. David, what are the stages of making it through whose? Well, it's not a competition. And uh, each person does this program according to their own pace. 
And we have a saying in Hoos, if at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. <laughs> Thank you, David, very much. David, you and your young disciples are constantly uprooted from McMahon's Point to North Sydney, then to Wollongong, then to Mossman, always looking for a home. How'd you like a house at Cronulla, Dave? <laughs> your good friend, famous rugby league coach Jack Gibson, and with him another friend and supporter, Jack Muller. Jack Gibson, what made you offer a house to David? Well, to David probably didn't come that quick or that easy. That uh, I knew, I went over and saw Dave and things were getting pretty skinny. And we had a little uh, meeting at my place with some business friends of mine, namely Alan, Alan David and John here, and uh, they offered a little bit more than uh, advice. And we uh, got things together out there for a little while. But uh, I only played a very skinny part in the deal. I think it was all David, and David to me has been a person that uh, is uh, aware of the needs of other people. Right. I'd like to say something about this gentleman. It's, uh, I only ever quit once, and uh, I was pretty sick and depressed at the time, and I just mentally gave up. And these two gentlemen came round to see me. And I found out that Jack Gibson has got one of the most motivating tongues that God ever put in a human being because he hurt me and he made me move. And for that, Jack, I'll ever be grateful. Thank you, Dave. Jack Muller, will you tell us about David? Roger, I, as Jack said, the uh, first time I met, met David was at uh, Jack's home. And we uh, then formed a committee to try and raise some funds to help him on his way. And I'm glad to say we were successful and have been able to provide some of the funds for David on a continuing basis. Jack Muller, Jack Gibson, thank you for being with us tonight. <laughs> Meantime, more and more victims come for help. David, you taught us how to deal with our children's problems. Three parents and friends, David, Brenda Brown, Rhonda Greentree and Margaret McMullen. Brenda, first of all, will you tell us how David helped you? Yes, Roger. David taught um, the parents that we don't have to wait until our children get onto hard drugs before we can help them, that we can help them if we recognise the addictive personality beforehand, and that if the parents go to the counselling meetings, we can quite often help the child to get help. And when the child is admitted into who's, um, it's far better for us to keep the door closed until they've been through the programme. Uh, four years ago, we discovered our 16-year-old daughter was using heroin. She had lost so much weight and lost a beautiful personality. And we rang Li Lifeline. They referred us to Who's and David. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't had Who's. And I'm proud to say that today she's a counsellor helping other people. And she's my wife. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, David, your story has a very happy ending, has it not, Margaret? Because your daughter... <laughs> Rhonda, after your son Robert first finds hope at Who's, he loses his life away from their care, and yet you continue to support David. Now, why? Well, Robert started smoking marijuana at 14 and progressed to heroin. He was a Hoos for about five and a half weeks and had to appear in court. I was told to leave Hoos and five weeks after that, Rob died from an overdose of methadone. And David was a terrific support to me at that time. And I'll just do whatever I can now to help him and Hoos. David, in September of last year, you were forced to seek a new home once again, and in one dramatic night, the parent group come up with enough money to buy a rundown inn near Armadale, New South Wales. But it only houses 35 people, not enough for the growing number of addicts that you are helping. Then you hear about an old station house with 75 acres of pasture and dairy at Inveralaki near Goulburn, New South Wales. With the help of several businessmen, you make a down payment and 70 residents move in. 
together you name it, Green Tree House in memory of Rhonda Green Tree's son, Robert. At Inveradike, David, you and your team move into empty buildings which have been neglected for several years. Whose members, as usual, do everything, cooking, washing, painting and rebuilding? At present, there are 120 addicts there, including adolescents and babies of addicted mothers. Whose runs the dairy herd owned by a local company which you are hoping to buy? Now, David, a recent visitor is famous educator from Christian Brothers Goulburn, Brother Mazzarini, on film from London. When I went out to Green Trees in Inverality recently, I was very much taken with what I saw because what I felt that you were giving them was confidence in themselves. What you gave, I saw, as respect and reverence and love for themselves and for one another. I must say that I felt that there was a great reservoir of calm and tranquility and healing that existed there because people had confidence in what you were doing and what they were doing. Not a confidence that was arrogant, or that was boastful, but the sort of confidence that a child might have when he's learning to walk, full of trust, but not quite. So I would like to say, Dave, that it pleases very, me very much that more people are believing in you because your theory of respect and reverence and love is right. In fact, Dave, I think you're spot on. <laughs> David, a major achievement begins in 1977 when magistrates begin to remand young drug offenders to Who's for treatment. This year, the Attorney General states his public support. Today, Who's is a vital reality, and New South Wales leads Australia's fight against addiction. In the front line with you is the Minister for Health, Kevin Stewart. Kevin, what would you like to say about David and Who's Fellowship? Well, Roger, I knew David and his work with Who's Fellowship as the Shadow Minister for Health, so I was happy to make a decision to support the Fellowship. What he's done is develop a drug rehabilitation program in Australia, uh, and he's done it against uh, tremendous obstacles and, and frustrations, obstacles <laughs> and frustrations which would have daunted an ordinary person, but David's not an ordinary person, and I congratulate him on the work that he's done and I look forward uh, to a continued association with David and Who's Fellowship. Thank you very much, Kevin. Kevin Stewart, thank you very much. Thank you. David, the huge number of candidates in, as you call them, are the challenge. Every graduate, the candidate out, is a victory for that person, for Who's, and for Australia. And to complete our celebration, here are six candidates out from Who's Fellowship, escorted by your daughter, Melanie. <laughs> David. You and the youthful Who's residents and those supporting you have given the lead to people of conscience all over this country to take heart and fight for the minds and the lives of their children. David Gordon, this is your life.
Guest stay at the Travel Lodge and the Boulevard Hotel. Bringing people together like this is part of TAA's Friendly Way service. just south of Goulburn in New South Wales. It's one of five centres run by Hoos, and it's home for 144 drug addicts and 14 children. Hoos rehabilitation program is a strictly regimented system with a rigid hierarchy, but for those on nursery duty, it can still be fun. Little ducks and Baba -ba black sheep are a long way from the booze, drugs and prisons these men were used to in New South Wales. But it's all part of the treatment. All the addicts are assigned tasks suited to their level of responsibility. For newcomers, looking after themselves is all that's required. When that has been mastered, they look after others. For these would-be troubadours, it means supervising the preschoolers like Kelly for eight hours a day, six days a week. Kelly's mother is 28-year-old Margaret Prestridge. She's been in Hoos for five months, and like all parents, she works away from the nursery and the children, while re-establishing her independence from drugs. Margaret's 12-year history of drug taking is typical of many at Hoos. I started drinking when I was about 12. Then about 15, I started smoking marijuana and dropping acid. Then I was on methadrine for about 15 months or something, then I went to morphine. Heroin. Three years ago, Margaret married the father of one of her two children. He too was an addict, and they married after his release from jail. Then we both decided not to use but it was just talking through our hats. And he used to go out sneakily and have a hit, you know, and he OD'd, died. Well, you should give me some fried onions and onions and I'll, um, I'll cut them up. So while the children are in the nursery all day, Margaret has kept busy cleaning and cooking. But how does she feel about the children being looked after all day by other addicts, some former criminals? Um, it used to worry me at first, but I don't know, like they're here to help themselves too, you know, and they get from the higher levels and mothers that, are, that run the unit tell them what they've got to do. So it's not all the, it's not their own doing what they've got to do with them, you know. It's passed down through the mothers. Forty-seven-year-old Raymond Hurley has seven children of his own. He hasn't seen them for a while. For until recently, he was sleeping on a park bench in Sydney. Raymond developed a habit for heroin while serving in the army in Korea. Raymond, can you tell us how long you've been in the program and how long you've been in the nursery here? Uh, yes, I've been here. This is my end of my second week and I've been in the nursery two weeks. At the moment, I'm testing the see if it's all right for the children. It's a bit strong and I think I'd better stick to it. So it's not a bad brew, you know. What's, what's the, the best thing about being in the nursery? Do you enjoy being here with the kids? Well, sometimes I hate it, but the thing is I need it. Why do you hate it? Um, the responsibility, uh, because in, in, in the past I've always dodged away from things like that. Uh, any authority or, or responsibility, it's part of my makeup being an addict. Where were we at? Oh, where were we at? <laughs> How did I forget you? 
Raymond got in touch with Hoos after repeated encounters with an old army sergeant, now a policeman.